skills and wants to know what are the benefits of my travels and has gone on to claim that it is all about my earnings. I want to ask the national community to focus on what is real, what is sensible, and to ignore the foolishness of those who claim to be parliamentarians in our country, but whose job it is to mislead and worse, to undermine the national effort. You may recall that when I became prime minister, one of the first things I had to do was to go to Jamaica to smooth the feathers of the Jamaican business community who were well advanced in organizing a boycott against the products from Trinidad and Tobago. That was the result of the culmination of the handling or mishandling of our relations with a major CARICOM market. Another thing that I had to do, which I did at the first CARICOM meeting that I went to as head of the government in Trinidad and Tobago, was to put back on the agenda of CARICOM the whole question of the CARICOM single market and economy effort. That was off the agenda. And of course, it went off the agenda in the absence of a Trinidad and Tobago rep at a CARICOM heads of government meeting. It came back on the agenda with such resolve that it, we, led by Trinidad and Tobago, we requested and hosted here in Trinidad a special CARICOM meeting to deal with that issue. And out of it came an agreement, consensus, to effect and work towards strengthening and improving our market. It's called the St. Anne's Accord, driven by Trinidad and Tobago, St. Anne's in Trinidad. What this indicated was a willingness of CARICOM to work together. Trinidad and Tobago's mantra at CARICOM and our leadership effort at CARICOM has been and continues to be that we are stronger together, speaking together, working together, and of course, benefiting together. It was that approach that saw CARICOM going to the United Nations. It was led, the delegation was led by myself and the Prime Minister of Barbados at the request of CARICOM to talk to the Secretary General of the United Nations with respect to worrisome developments that were developing in Venezuela and had serious consequences for Trinidad and Tobago and the rest of CARICOM had those developments played out in the natural way that people expected it to play out. The relationship in CARICOM today is probably the best it has ever been. I have been in cabinet in this country since 1991. I've worked closely with the previous prime minister and I have been the prime minister here for almost nine years. And I can tell you that the relationship between CARICOM leaders and CARICOM governments today is the best that it has ever been as far as I know. One of the reasons for that is that there are a number of new prime ministers in CARICOM, except for Dominica and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Most of the prime ministers are people who came in in recent times. I am probably in the 5% of those who've been around the longest. And for some people, that is reason to go home. But for other people, there's a benefit in that. Because I can tell you, Trinidad and Tobago has not shaped its responsibility in CARICOM. In fact, we have led on this issue of stronger together. We had, for us in Trinidad and Tobago, we had the Venezuelan issue, which still exists to a certain extent. We had the Haiti issue, which we still have, frontally. And of course, recently, we've had 
the a summit with Canada first time, and we just had a summit with Saudi Arabia. What is interesting is that when we met in Saudi Arabia recently at this inaugural summit, it's probably one of the first times that we easily got every single CARICOM government present and represented, and I think represented by the head of government of the countries. And that's a good thing, because it meant that CARICOM was moving as a well-oiled unit. So when we sat down with the decision makers, we are able to be respected, to be heard, <coughs> and to be cooperated with. And that is how it has been throughout. And I've said to this country, not in joke, but in, ac in assuming a serious responsibility, that in so far as these external matters are concerned, that I regard the Prime Minister's office, with myself in there, as the country's number one salesman. So while there are others who will tell you how bad Trinidad and Tobago is and how bad things are and how disastrous it is, my job is the opposite, to try and present our country in the best that we could be externally. And I could tell you that our diplomacy, particularly under the recent leadership and the ministry of Dr. Brown, has seen Trinidad and Tobago go to places that we had not been for a long, long time. And that has resulted in us currently holding the position of President of the United Nations and a number of other important positions around where Trinidad and Tobago's position and our point of view is sought after and respected. <laughs> tomorrow morning, one of my assignments tomorrow morning is to have a conversation with the Prime Minister of Korea. We've just come from Saudi Arabia, we've just come from Canada, and of course we have other issues and other irons in the fire. So please do not let anybody, especially self-serving parliamentarians in Trinidad and Tobago, tell you that we are not stronger together and that we are in fact deficient in matters of foreign policy and government engagement. With respect to our trade and arrangements, they say no news is good news. Minister Paula Gopiskun is very active and present in CARICOM with all our trading matters. And it's not to say that we do not have instances of disagreement or instances of challenges, but we have been managing them without any public discord or disturbing fanfare. We have a number of trade issues which on a regular basis the minister travels to and take part, goes there with cabinet direction, having got the guidance of cabinet, and Trinidad and Tobago is there to ensure that our interests and regional interests are well served. With respect to Venezuela, it was not by accident that Minister Young was appointed minister in the office of the prime minister. That was one of the initial appointments I made for the specific purpose of doing two things. One, getting the benefit of his legal skills. And secondly, ensuring that we put on our front burner at the top of our priority list this whole question of what do we do about our declining gas reserves. To some people, if we wait long enough, the dry season will turn into the rainy season and we'll get rain. Or the rainy season will turn into the dry season and we'll get dry grass. But any responsible government of Trinidad and Tobago, as we are coming into office in 2015, we could not but have seen that this country's future was in grave jeopardy. Maybe not the immediate, but the future, the medium term, and certainly the long term, is in grave jeopardy if we do not find additional supplies of natural gas in particular. There are persons in who carry national conversation here, the Jim Gerum, and they come on the radio, 
or they go in the newspapers and they write all kinds of unsolicited advice, including that we should not be pursuing our gas business because the rest of the world is shutting it down for electricity, electric cars, and they'd be no longer um, doing um, internal combustion engines and so, as if we don't know that, <clears throat> as if we aren't aware of what is happening with climate change. But we are also aware that those who are loudest in the call to treat with the existential climate threat are very busy expanding their hydrocarbon business. The United States has quadrupled its production in natural gas. And instead of being a purchaser of our natural gas, it's an exporter and competitor. As a matter of fact, there is a point of view in some quarters that the difficulty that we are having with Venezuela and getting access to Venezuela gas is not only about any concerns about elections in Venezuela, but it's about keeping our competitor out of the market. And the people of Trinidad and Tobago should look at where we get our meals from and determine just in a visionary way what will be our position if the situation with respect to natural gas and petrochemical business dries up or deteriorates to a point of insignificance in Trinidad and Tobago? Who will pay the bills? Where will the money come from to pay the bills that we accept now? as an entitlement. The government spends billions every month to pay public servants, to have free secondary education, to put medicine in the hospital, to provide $5 billion in grants to people every year, supporting those who are needy. Where would that money come from if our gas reserves continue to fall in the way they were falling when we came into office and if we had done what others had done? So access to gas is a lifeblood story for Trinidad and Tobago. And I want the national community to think about that. Because the, those who you know, jump up and down and be happy when we come against stumbling blocks, I don't know what they'll offer you if those stumbling blocks are not overcome. And the effort that we have put in in doing the logical thing of trying to get commercial access to gas in a neighboring country has taken up the attention and the effort of this government in a way that most other things have not because it has been so important and continues to be so important. And we have overcome significant hurdles where today we are at the point having got a carve out, an exemption after serious work in Washington, both on our part and the part of our lobbyists there and the members of parliament in the United States who we have contacted, befriended, recruited to this cause. As a matter of fact, whenever I go to Washington, I've been to Washington on this particular assignment and in one day I've made five speeches to five different interest groups, to people who are opposed to it, to convince them that they should be on our side. These things take time. They take competence, they take patience, and they take a belief in your country, which has to be respected in certain quarters. And that is what we have been doing. So when somebody in our parliament come telling you about how much per diem the prime minister gets, ladies and gentlemen, I want to ask you all to just ignore these idiots and focus in supporting the efforts of the government that is trying to ensure that there's blood in our veins and our arteries in the months and years ahead. Especially when these are people who actively undermine our attempt. As the government of Trinidad and Tobago in its foreign policy was saying no to the invasion of Venezuela, and saying that the United Nations acknowledges the Maduro government and we have no reason to do otherwise, they were supporting another president who today has disappeared into thin air. They encouraged the Venezuelan opposition to oppose us. And they take umbrage when the word treason is raised. 
They go to Australia, they encourage the Australian opposition and the Australian Attorney General to oppose us when we seek to get help from Australia to get our ferries for the entire island service. And coming and telling me now that I must account to them when I travel? I account to the people of Trinidad and Tobago because it is your business that I'm after. And understand that if those overtures fail, it's not that I will fail, it's that the people of Trinidad and Tobago will fail. And that is why I have given it the number one priority. Number one, to ensure that we do not fail. And that is why today, the ferry service to Tobago from Trinidad is about the best in the world. We have two of the best ferries in the world running back and forth between Trinidad and Tobago. And that is why today, we are no longer under the yoke of the U.S. sanction against Venezuela. We are negotiating an operational license now. These are not short journeys. And these are not successes of a government that spends its time responding to the undermining efforts of an opposition that has nothing to offer. They rejoice when we have difficulty in this country, but that's what they do. On the other hand, the government of Trinidad and Tobago, we try to engage and solve our individual problems, even when, even when we have to solve it at the cost of some pain to the national community, because it is commonly known in many instances no pain, no gain. Those of you who've been around the sporting arena, you know that phrase. Right? So ladies and gentlemen, on the issue of Haiti, where Trinidad and Tobago is required to take a position, our position is, and has been at CARICOM, to encourage that there be some shifting of the current arrangement in Haiti which will allow a broadening of the governmental structure. Because this is our view, that to try to provide support for the existing structure has the potential to be rejected because it comes across as support for the existing political directorate, which you know is a makeshift arrangement that was put there after the, assass after the assassination of President Moïse. And we strongly believe that a great effort and greater effort should be paid to getting a broader based government to prepare Haiti for some time in the not too distant future to have some kind of election timetable and have the population be brought along. Today I think there's not a single elected official in Haiti and therefore to try and provide support propping up that arrangement is to invite failure. So our position is as I've just said, and that is the position that we advocate at CARICOM, and I can tell you it has widespread support at CARICOM, as I suppose, in our various meetings. With respect to Saudi Arabia, we have entertained here in the Caribbean a number of envoys on extended visits prior to this summit, building the relationship between our region that is being treated very harshly by the traditional colonial arrangements, especially those who believe that they are entitled to talk down to us or to treat us like children in the neighbor's yard, forever moving the goalposts, forever making rules and telling us what we are entitled to and where we belong. But we believe that our independence gives us the right to reach as far as we can across the world with no boundaries. So Trinidad and Tobago maintains its relationship with China, a relationship that was built by Dr. Eric Williams, the historian who told us in the beginning that the one China policy, where Beijing China is China, that is our foreign policy, it remains that way, and I can tell you today, notwithstanding all the difficulties, that Trinidad and Tobago's relationship with China is as good as it could have been or as it should be. Australia, I just mentioned to you, our relationship with Australia on the other side of the world down under 
is as strong as it could be as a, Carib as, as a Commonwealth country to the extent that we could have gone to them for help and would have come away with proper financial arrangements that saw us with two ferries and two Coast Guard vessels, almost a billion and a half dollars, something like that, funded from an arrangement in Australia. And of course, our relationship with India is also just as good. And Saudi Arabia is one of the, it's probably the, the second most interesting economy in the world today in terms of its growth, in terms of its vision for the new arrangements between countries, and also its willingness to work with CARICOM. Because we are aligned in very many ways. And as we met in summit in Riyadh, the alignment between the Saudi economy the Saudi government policy is so close with CARICOM that one wonders how come this didn't happen before. We've had a very successful summit. And as I said early on, when I talked to you about dealing with the oil companies, it makes sense to go to the top of the fountain, to plead your case and to make your decisions where the decisions are made abroad. And that is how we have approached our bilateral business. And that is how CARICOM has arranged and is arranging our regional business. We go to the decision makers. And that automatically involves our heads of government and meeting people where they are or bringing them to us where they're willing to come to us. It's a very active period. And I would ask Dr. Brown, as I have done, to be a little, in the coming weeks and months, to be a little more interactive with you here in the national media and the national population so that you can be properly educated and informed about these matters. Because our independence is important to us and our economy and our opportunities are not only affected by what goes on within our borders. Yes, a lot goes on within our border. Our local news is extremely important. But what goes on outside, in many instances, affects us long before you see it in what goes on within the border. And therefore, you need, at this time in particular, you need to pay attention to what is, being, what is happening outside in matters where we are involved. For example, there's a meeting coming up at the COP meeting, which I'll mention in a little while, where the general sentiment now in some quarters is that countries should come out of the production of hydrocarbons. In fact, in some instances, in the officialdom of this matter, there are dates being put against which, for example, you would have seen if you were following the, the, the developments, you would have seen where one of the largest producers of oil and gas is supposed to come out of that business by 2050. I'm talking here about the, the Emirates. And of course, next to them, you have Saudi Arabia. And of course, you can go spread around. But let's take the Emirates. You know how they responded to that? Their response to this expectation that they'll be out of the business is to say it's unrealistic. The world's demand for energy will require significant consumption of hydrocarbon energy well beyond 2050. And as a result of that, they are investing heavily in ensuring that they are in a position to market their natural gas and their, to a lesser extent, the oil, but certainly natural gas, which is viewed as the clean fuel. Trinidad and Tobago's official position abroad in these situations is to have led, led the conversation, yes, natural gas is the clean fuel. And we do not see in the medium term an absence of natural gas from the demand market for energy. So we will continue to put our efforts into ensuring 
that natural gas is available for us to market and continue to live off the earnings of that for at least some significant time. And of course, one of the conversations that we've had, um, and uh, Minister Young is talking in a continuation of those conversations tomorrow with Aramco Trading, where we have raised the possibility of some kind of alignment in the business of managing oil and refining to see if there's any possibility that we could do business with Aramco Trading. But those discussions are still at the infancy, but we will continue to make them to see what comes out of it. So don't ask me what is the outcome when we are now opening those doors. I have made it my business to come before you on this podium in particular on a regular basis and stay with you for long hours, ensuring that you are party to what is happening in the government. This is not something that you have been accustomed to. That has been the hallmark of my administration. I have stood before the local media for more hours than any other prime minister. And that being so, you cannot say that you are unaware of what the government is doing. You might not know all the details, because some of those details are, in fact, to be confidential for good reason. So let's good, let, let good order prevail that what is to be confidential for the time being will be. But what you need to know, we've always been here to answer your questions and to offer you, even before you ask the questions, what is happening in Trinidad and Tobago. And we, when I spoke to you last time, I did tell you that between um, mid-November and early December, there were three big meetings that I was going to attend, one after the other. It turns out that the dates for the, what they call the high-level meetings, meaning heads of government meetings for COP, eventually were settled around the 29th of this month. In the meantime, CARICOM was settling the summit, and that summit was settled on the 16th of November. In a bilateral basis, Trinidad and Tobago and the oil companies, our meetings are set in stone in the first week in December. So I could not reasonably expect to run from, the original intention was that I would go from the Saudi meeting to the COP meeting to the London meeting. But that could only have happened sensibly if the summit had been a bit later. With the summit being set for the 16th of uh, November, it would have meant that I would have had to stay in Dubai, or in Saudi Arabia for that matter, for about 11 days before the COP meeting starts. And of course, for those who have a question mark about the cost of things, that would have been a quarter million dollars for my team to remain between one meeting and the other. So what I've done is to put myself through the personal stress of coming back from Riyadh, having just gone there. And you must thank the Saudi government because the Saudi government provided all the transportation. They sent two planes to take the CARICOM leaders to Riyadh. Uh, what, 13 hours up, 14 hours back. So I did that, and I'm very happy that it was done, but it would mean that um, I took the decision as soon as the, COP, the, um, the, the summit meeting was settled on the 16th, I took the decision that I would forego attendance at the COP meeting because there was too much of a gap between these two meetings. Our delegation would be led by Minister Beckles, who is the minister who, who is... On, um, on, on station with the COP issues as Minister of Planning and Development. So Trinidad and Tobago will be well represented there, and there'll be other CARICOM leaders there, not all, but a few CARICOM leaders will be there as well. So the, um, and then um, work is going on right now, dotting the I's and crossing the legal T's with respect to one of the other big issues that we were engaged in, which is the restructuring of Atlantic LNG the LNG business, where our effort, largely as a result of the number of high-level meetings that we've had with Shell and BP, 
which has brought us billions of additional dollars in the, in the existing contracts and also got them to agree, contrary to what our advisors were telling us here, that they would never agree to any restructuring because as far as they were concerned, contracts were in stone. We didn't believe that. We believed that we had the competence to make the case and we've made the case and we've got agreement for the restructuring of Atlantic LNG in terms of the whole question of the shareholding and also the pricing mechanism from which we will draw our earnings, both of which would leave Trinidad and Tobago in a better earning position. So ladies and gentlemen, if I leave this job this evening, I would leave satisfied that I have dealt with the big ticket issue supported by the cabinet and the cabinet of Trinidad and Tobago has engaged some very large issues successfully. But of course, I didn't invent the comment that a prophet is not without honor, save for his own country. Ladies and gentlemen, the other issue that engages us on an ongoing basis is the misbehavior of a minority of our population who believe that crime should pay and that crime must pay. We remain engaged in fighting the criminal element in Trinidad and Tobago. And that remains a high priority. We've directed significant resources, increased those resources, stay focused, and support our police service as the agency that under law has the responsibility for responding to the potential and threat of criminal conduct and also responding to holding criminals accountable for their conduct. Having said that, I saw your news today and I've heard the conversation this morning, this whole question about negotiating peace with criminals. And let me make my position very clear on the position of the government of Trinidad and Tobago and the position of the parliament of Trinidad and Tobago. Gang warfare is gang activity is criminal conduct. As a matter of fact, it is criminal conduct that spawns the identification of gang, gang leader, gang warfare, gang peace, or gang war. The Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago understands this and has allotted significant amount of Parliament effort to codify the law, to allow the law enforcement in Trinidad and Tobago to respond to criminal conduct identified as gang activity. I refer here specifically to the anti-gang laws. And notwithstanding the fact that the police is required to speak to every citizen in this country if the police sees it fit, whether you are an abusing husband, a delinquent parent under the Truancy Act or otherwise, the police will speak to you and be authorized to speak to you. But what the police is not going to be authorized to do is to negotiate any abridgment of the laws of Trinidad and Tobago as it applies to any aspect of criminal conduct. And I say no more on that. Ladies and gentlemen, we have had a very successful meeting recently in Riyadh, where doors are now open to CARICOM, including Trinidad and Tobago, to review our involvement and management and access to international finance through our willingness of Saudi Arabia to work with us on that score. With respect to the access of finance for development projects, we found a very willing partner in a country that has the ability to be helpful in our development programs offering to partner with us, with finance, in a number of areas, in, many very, in very many CARICOM locations. Don't ask me where and when, 
because it's, it's too early for me to be telling you about this, that, or the other. I'm just telling you what doors have been opened to us. And we intend, if we put our heads together in Trinidad and Tobago, or if we see opportunity to be better off, to go through some of these doors, whether it is in finance, in energy, in diplomacy, in education, in culture, because as you would have seen, one of the things that was raised by Trinidad and Tobago um, was the whole question of ease of transportation from our region into the holy places of Mecca, where our population, which is very significant, we have a significant Muslim population here for whom the Hajj to Mecca is a command from Allah. And it is, in fact, now it has an economic side to it. And I hope that our people would have seen the effort that we are making to ensure that they don't have to go to Venezuela for a passport, for, for a visa, and travel to the, Mech, to the Hajj through Turkey. We are hoping that the time will come when they can smoothly travel from here to, to Saudi Arabia and carry out their religious duties. The Saudis, one of their diversification efforts is a huge leap into tourism. The numbers are staggering as to the amount of tourists that they're receiving and putting out. And their investment that exists now and will exist even in greater numbers when they um, operationalize a new airline that would have many tens of jumbo jets specifically for growing tourism around the world. And we who live in the Caribbean and know for a fact that it is the most attractive area in the world for tourism, we are interested in that kind of development. And Trinidad and Tobago with its own airline, Caribbean Airlines, we are on the ground floor of ensuring that whatever is growing here, that we are, if not a branch, that we are a twig of it. And what we have found is a willingness on the part of the Saudi authorities to help us to do that. So ladies and gentlemen, it has been very successful. And we will continue. Um, I, you, must have, you might have heard me at an earlier time saying that we've had discussions of sharing rather than having every CARICOM country having an embassy everywhere around the world and, having, and we were talking about sharing with other CARICOM. We were in discussions with Barbados on this matter on sharing our outreach in certain locations. That has come up with our new initiatives with Saudi Arabia and of course one of the things that is on the table, on offer, is a CARICOM uh, house in Riyadh where any or all CARICOM countries can be accommodated to have its embassy. And Trinidad and Tobago will take advantage of that offer in the very near future. Um, it, would, it would require certain adjustments in our thinking. We are, pre-COVID and pre-certain developments in the Middle East, we had certain initiatives on the way, but we have to adjust to the changes that have been made, and we are now in a position to welcome um, our presence in, again, one of the fastest growing cities and the regional capital that just happens to sit between Asia, Africa, and Europe. You can't get a better location than that. So. And, and to have a willingness to work with us there is a great positive. So you will hear more about that, and Dr. Brown will tell you about that in the com as, as it develops in the coming days. So let me just stop here for now, and I'm sure you have a few questions that you may want to ask me that I might be able to answer. Anthony, you came in, you came in late. You can't, because you can't come last. Anthony, you were there when I passed? <laughs> All right, use, use your seniority. We're going to have it on. It's going to be seniority. Anthony first, yes. That, that must be a great question, eh? Yeah. Um, Prime Minister, you no, you, you can sit, you can sit. Thank you. You said the relationship in CARICOM is the best it's ever been, as far as you are aware. But you also said that uh, natural gas, access to natural gas, is a lifeblood issue for the United States. 
Venezuela is holding a referendum on December the 3rd in which the people of Venezuela are going to be asked, asked to say whether they agree with the Venezuelan government that Esequibo is part of Venezuela. How does that referendum and what may come after it um, impact on Trinidad and Tobago in CARICOM and Trinidad and Tobago for whom um, natural gas is a lifeblood issue? If there's any country that understands the principled position of Trinidad and Tobago, it is Venezuela. Because it is on a Venezuelan issue where Venezuelan lifeblood was at stake that Trinidad and Tobago took its most public principled position, not once, but more than once. You may recall, maybe you're too young to know that, that this, this, this Esuquibo issue had flared up at one time. And it was just as scary as it is now. And it was Dr. Williams of Trinidad and Tobago who brought about some easing of the tension. We are confident that the governments of Venezuela and Guyana would know that CARICOM's position that our region must be and remain a zone of peace is the best position for all of us. And secondly, we would all know that even in the darkest hour, Trinidad and Tobago's position was that if difficulties arise, the response ought to be dialogue, dialogue, and dialogue. It was a Venezuelan issue that took Trinidad and Tobago in the leadership in CARICOM with our colleagues to Uruguay alongside Mexico and Norway, saying this in favor of Venezuelans making Venezuelan decisions in difficulty. There's nothing new here. There's nothing new here. As a matter of fact, we need not and must not deviate from what exists, which is the principal position that our region must remain a zone of peace. And all difficulties must be colored by that principled position. Guyana knows that it has the support of CARICOM on this matter. And Venezuela knows that CARICOM supports Guyana on this matter. So let us not overreact or overreach, because that the greatest so it's fair, it's fair itself, right? So, and of course, Trinidad, uh, Trin Trinidad and Tobago views Venezuela as our closest neighbor with whom we have and will maintain, continue to maintain, as we've done for decades, close and working relationship. And of course, Guyana, as the capital of CARICOM, Trinidad and Tobago, is heavily invested there as well. We all know it, and I think we all know what's happening. It would be a it would be a tragedy indeed if we misunderstand what is happening and mishandle it. Sir, yes. You spoke about crime earlier. Just tell me your name again, please, because Akash Samaru and and if, you, if you can um, put a question, remind me of who sure. Prime Minister, like well. Prime Minister Akash Samaru, okay. CNC Three News. You spoke about crime earlier. What's going on with the crime talks with the opposition? Where are we with that? Kind of. Well, where we are is that we were invited by the president to try to meet, have some meeting of the minds, where parliamentarians' rule could be, um, be brought to bear on the intractable crime problem. As far as I'm aware, uh, that our response at the government was yes, there's, you know, we had a number of stumbling blocks. Parliamentarians know what their role is, but there were stumbling blocks and disagreements. And if our other colleagues are willing to sit and talk with us um, outside of the parliament, then we're happy to do that. And we took steps immediately to do that. But of course, we can only speak for ourselves. Because you may recall that when I said that we would, 
the first thing we got was agreement that we would meet after the budget because this thing was initiated just on the cusp of the budget coming into being. And both of us, leadership of the parliament said, after the budget. I was not surprised when during the budget debate, my colleagues started making a fuss that the government has not responded. That was the day we were, we were, we were in parliament. Going, going through the budget, the budget had not yet passed the, low, fa passed the lower house, far less the upper house. But they were throwing out this thing about the government's recalcitrance in the matter. It just so happened it was the same day that I wrote to the opposition leader identifying the um, four people who would take part in these discussions. That very day, I sent the letter out the morning and the afternoon, there was a press conference where the government was being attacked and being accused of um, not being serious about it. How did we respond? We said that, okay, um, having received a long, I think it was six pages from the opposition leader that vented all the politics and all the self-congratulations and all that, I didn't deal with that. Yes, we're going to meet. You wrote six pages. We sent back a list of the known and even unknown areas of legislation where the opposition had not been welcoming to our ideas. And of course, we said, we are going to deal in these talks with what you bring and what we bring. But you have to have some order. Eight people for him for it. And of course, we said the Attorney General would chair. And that seemed to have immediately offended the opposition. How could I dare the, the Attorney General? And we had five people and they have four. Now, it makes you wonder, what exactly is their view of these kind of talks? Because if you're going to meet, we're not meeting by a bar to drink some rum or to drink, have a few beers and talk with some girls. Somebody has to convene it. Somebody has to chair it. Somebody has to be in charge of advancing it as a process. They insist that it must not be the Attorney General because the government will have five and they have four. I didn't know it was a voting process. I thought we were meeting to talk. And four members of the government and four members of the opposition is a huge part of the parliament meeting there on a particular issue. And of course, I see it being said that the prime minister must lead it. Now, that tells me that I don't want to say that they're not serious. Because if I say that, I'll be guessing. What I do know, and I will say it here now, this idea of crime talks does not excuse the government from its responsibility of being responsible for the country's safety and security. We all know that. And if we rely and wait on the opposition to help us do that or to do that for us, the government will get nothing done. Because it is my view, having worked with this particular group of people in the opposition, that they do not want any improvement in the crime situation in this country. Because they believe that if the country is being beaten down by regular, frequent, outrageous criminal conduct, that is a political bonanza for them to engage verbally and for them to engage and campaign on electorally. So they don't really want any change. If anybody is desperate for a change in this country in this matter, it's the government. Because the government is held responsible for the safety and security and the personal conduct of everybody in this country. So when you tell me that you are not going to name people unless the prime minister is chairing it, you couldn't be serious. And again, this is not the first time. I want to remind you all, because you people in the media have a habit of not looking back on Monday to see what happened on Friday. Before crime got to the height that it got in the national conversation, what was the conversation in this country with respect to government failure? It was health. It was the dispensing of health services in the country. So what did the new government do in 2015? Early in our, in our tenure, we 
put together the Welsh Committee to investigate and report to the government on the whole question of health care delivery in Trinidad and Tobago. That committee delivered two reports, of A, a party, and a part B. When we got those reports, this is dealing with health care delivery in the country, that they were jumping up and down, the health system collapsed, and the health system collapsed, and some collapsed. You remember that story? When we got to the parliament, what did the government do? The government said, here is the report from the Welsh Committee. We sent it to a joint select committee of the parliament because in there, there are certain fundamental decisions that require to be made by a parliament that has accepted certain things, which if they are to be changed, would require some significant parliamentary approval. We sent it to a joint select committee of parliament, meaning government, opposition, and independence. That is what our constitution allows for collaboration between parliamentarians. So all those who call them for crime talks, there's a provision for that. What did the opposition do in that situation? You know what the opposition did? The leader of the opposition, quite casually and blase, said deliberately refused to appoint any opposition member to the Joint Select Committee that was going to deal with health care delivery. And as a result of the opposition not participating, there could not have been any consensus approach to fundamental changes in the delivery of health care. One of the points in that whole situation, I think was a fundamental one which brought the part B of the report, was what do we do about private sector, um, public sector doctors conducting private sector business using the hospitals to harvest patients or spending more time in their surgery as against the salary time in the public service. Those are the kind of discussions that came up. And the opposition wanted no part of it. So now we're talking about national security. The biggest issue I'm seeing as I'm conducting my work as head of the government with my cabinet colleagues, fighting crime through the Ministry of National Security and other, other ministries, what I'm seeing is the opposition talking about crime talks. But the singular most important thing according to them is that the government must open up these talks to national consultation so that Tom, Dick and Harry and NGOs and former commissioner of police and party could be part of it. Well, that is not our idea of parliamentarians seeking to treat with the obstacles that are in our way, unknown issues. I want to remind you all, we went to parliament with an anti-gang bill. Was, or was the bail bill? Was the anti-gang bill? Both, the bail bill and the anti-gang bill. We spoke at length in the parliament, talking about the issue, because that's what parliamentarians do. In the parliament, you talk about it, all aspects of it, all angles of it, and you come to a position, a decision to implement, implement and impact law. What did the opposition do? For the bail bill, which was something that they had for their use, requested by the police, they wanted no part of it. Anti-gang bill, they voted no part of that too. Because where you have a special majority and the opposition does not cast a vote in favor, abstention is as good as a vote against. So when they tell you, we, we voted for, meaning an abstention, it was after the anti-gang bill was voted down and there was a public outcry about the behavior of the leader of the opposition and her charges that they hurriedly come and tell the government, bring it back, bring it back, bring it back, and let us amend, let us um, uh, change the standing order for, for the moment. And because under the standing order, when you vote it down, you can't bring it back under six months. But the public response was so negative for them that they said, okay, we will ask for a, ch a, a change in the standing order so we can have it immediately and we brought it back. And even then, to get them to vote, 
they had to, with the water down here, the water down there, and the water down there, and eventually voted for the water down version. That is what I'm dealing with. I, who voted for the budget of 2015, going to 2016, I was the opposition leader. Go and check the parliament record. They brought the budget for 2016, and the PNM voted for the budget because we vote for the interests of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And for them to have a better tomorrow, not for it to be better for us electorally. So we want more killing, we want more this and that. They can't talk about nothing else more than murder and killing and crime. That's all they talk about. But you see, the government talks about it too. The government acts on it too. But there are 25 other areas that the government has to deal with. And that is why in all this difficulty with the criminal activity in this country, I have been laser focused on those issues where our future depends and may be at risk. So we're different. In short, to answer your question, the government has put it out. It is for the opposition to have participated. And like they did with the help, joint select committee, they refused to participate. So you know the opposition are saying that it's, it's your side that's holding up the discussions because last time we asked the opposition leader a few days ago what's going on, she said she's still waiting on you to reply to that six-page, as you mentioned, letter on October 14 that she sent. I, the chief, one of the chief questions was, will you be a part of it? This is not about me. This is not about me. It's about the government meeting the opposition. They deal with personalities. We deal with institutions. That's the difference. This is not about me, for me to promote myself. Self-promotion is for them. I have woke up to my eyeball. Understand? And I'm, I can guarantee you that when I am not there, the team that is sent there from this PNM government will do exactly what the people's interests require, which is to look after the people's interests, to tell me and to make it a condition. Apparently, she wants to talk to me. She has my phone number. She knows where I live. If the opposition leader says, I want to come and see you, no. I tell you, come. I'm going to come and tell me about if we have to talk about an issue, whether it's crime or it's judging or draining or oceaning, don't tell me that if I am not there, it cannot go forward. I have not put myself in that situation, so. When I am not here, isn't there a prime minister in the office? When I am not in this country, isn't somebody in the office of prime minister and the country runs along as smoothly as ever? That's how it is. I don't put myself in a situation where if I am not there, maybe that's how it is with her. She wants to promote herself through crime talks. I want the government to talk to the opposition. If she can't find four people to say, talk to the government, then say so. But the bottom line is to say that if I don't have and she's naming certain people who must be in the talks, you know. And that's another story for another time. Prime Minister, good afternoon. Prime Minister, Harry, is FB News. Uh, Prime Minister, um, you know, you said um, that the crime um, is the biggest problem, right? What about, you know, the, the public who may think, um, may have a sense of hope if they see the Prime Minister, you, you know, any opposition leader, sit down. This is not this is not this is not about optics. We said when the contact was made, we will you will say what you think we should be dealing with. I would say what we should be dealing with. So tell us what you think and we put a team and I suggested four people. And you remember, the opposition outlined a whole set of things that would take, become part of these talks, including uh, some of it was the, the commission of police work, other things about stand your ground. These are the things that were interesting to them. The government listed what was interesting to the government. We focus on the legislative agenda. Much of it is known to you, and much of it you would have seen the opposition's position on them, right? And 
that was a basis. This is a rough, a rough agenda. When we meet to talk about crime in its totality, those were the concepts, and there might have been other things coming in there. But if you take the position that you're not going to meet because you don't like who is going to be chairing it, you don't like how the vote is going to go, and the absence of the prime minister to lead the government team. So let me ask you something. When four cabinet members go there to crime to talk to their position, you think they're going there on their own? Are they going there on their own, or are they going there under the authority of the prime minister? What kind of baby play, play talk? This is not, this is not child's play. I didn't say I am going. I am going to Saudi Arabia, and I am going to COP, and I am going to to, to 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 London, and therefore we can't initiate these discussions until February. I didn't say that. I put things in place for if the talks are going to be of any value, we can start talking now. Because I can guarantee you that the four people I have sent there to represent the government, the government is represented under the authority and the guidance of a prime minister. And if some people can't understand that, I saw one of, you know, those who like to advise people is jumping up and down and advising me, the prime minister must go. Must, on what basis? What are you saying that the government can't function unless the prime minister is in fact in front? There are a number of things going on in this government in this country that the prime minister is not involved in. Of course, crime is very important. But that is talking to the opposition, and opposition with the record I just gave you there. I knew, I wouldn't, I'm not surprised that they're taking this position. And let me just say this. When the opposition leader is telling me that unless the condition is met where Gary Griffith is part of a team to talk at the end meeting, that should tell you all you need to know. You know. That should tell you all, all you need to know. Because I want to draw to your attention, all of you. It was the Police Service Commission, not me, not me as the Prime Minister, not me as Minister of National Security, Chairman of National Security Council. It was the Police Service Commission that found and sent former appeal court judge Stanley John to go to the police service in the face of allegations and documentation and report back to the police service commission what he sees is going on in the police service, particularly in the area of the management of firearms and ammunition in this country. That is an undisputed fact. When Justice Stanley John carried out that assignment for the commission, he did a very unusual thing. He sent a copy of his report to the prime minister. And he justified that by saying he was so concerned about what he saw and that national security was being so impacted that he thought on his own that the chairman of the National Security Council must be aware of what he saw. So even as he sent his report to the Police Service Commission, he sent a copy to the Prime Minister. And in that report, two things should come to your attention. One is that he said he saw a well-oiled criminal enterprise, and two, he recommended criminal investigation for that department. That is his report to the Police Service Commission. The government had seen it fit not to renew the contract of Gary Griffith. And you come here to tell me now that if we're going to have crime talks on left Gary Griffith there, they can't have no crime talks. Need I tell you any more? The same Gary Griffith, who when the government took a chance and gave that soldier an opportunity to run the police service. Three years later, Justice John is reporting in the way he has reported. And 
his presence in crime talks between the government and the opposition is the deal breaker? And who's pushing that? His former colleagues who didn't give him a vote. Let me just draw the country's attention to something else too. For those of you who are easily swayed by the day's flavor, it is a long time now that the country's leadership has been coming or has come to the conclusion that the police service in Trinidad and Tobago did not have it in its upper echelons what is required to effectively confront the criminal element. It's against that background that we ended up here with Gibbs and Iwatsky. There were lots of senior police officers in the police service. We ended up with Gibbs and Iwatsky. That failed after two years, okay? But it was a, an attempt to bring into the police service something that the country's leadership thought was not there. It failed. For the next three years, you had the Stephen Williams saga, where every six months, the Police Service Commission would give Mr. Williams a six month, and a six month, and, and, and they're talking about 10 days, and that belittling the man, and so on, right? That went on for three years. In the meantime, the criminals got more and more proficient. Then when we came in as a new government, that had not changed. We too thought that we would bring into the police service a management from outside because we couldn't see from the list that was in front of us what we wanted to see. So we took the chance and we brought a soldier in as head of the police service. You know, there are a number of people in this country who lose their name after they get a little post. They become a former this and former that and former the other. You never see him saying now as a former soldier for my commissioner. But let me just remind you all, it was a soldier who we put as head of the police service for 36 months. That failed spectacularly. To the point where I suspect that we are unique situation in the, in, in the, in the Commonwealth, where the prime minister of this country indicating that certain audit reports will go before the parliamentary committee on national security. And what was the response to that? It was a lawsuit where the Prime Minister is injuncted from telling you, by way of the Parliament, what caused Justice John to have written what he wrote to the Police Service Commission. So I stand before you now. I know things that you don't know and you can't know because I'm injuncted. <laughs> and you're telling me I must sit down with him to talk crime. Of course he qualified to talk crime. I've had enough of this foolishness. I'm focusing on the job that I took the oath of office to do. And this country has too many schools and too many universities for you all to be falling for the foolishness. There are more people in the opposition who spend their day worried about the police than maybe on Duncan Street. But they're out front, leading the national conversation, upsetting your psyche, and holding out the prospect of something better, and laying down conditions. They will lay down no condition for this government. We represent the people of Trinidad and Tobago by majority, whatever it is, and we have a responsibility. And it is in that context that we will not be played in that way. We went ahead with the health system that they wanted no part of. We went ahead, we completed the Coover Hospital, we built the Point 14 Hospital, we built the Arima Hospital, and we're building the, 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 the tower in the Port of Spain General Hospital, and we built a number of other health facilities. And as God will have it, when COVID came to us, the same health service that they were bad mountain, it collapsed, it collapsed, it collapsed. We distinguish ourselves in protecting our citizens because we had a health system that we were all proud of, even though we had to go to court 65 times because they took us to court to lie about what is happening in the hospital systems. That's our record. And I will say it again. We have parliamentary colleagues who have a great day when the criminals 
carry the outrages in this country because they see it as being of political value. And that is the long and the short of it. The government will continue to confront the criminal element and we will give the police all the support and we expect that others like the, the judiciary and other arms of the state will fall in and tell us what time of day it is because all of us are exposed to the wiles and the outrages of a criminal element who believe that they have support in certain quarters in this country. Yes. Responsibility in terms of, let's say, new legislation as this year's closing into the new year to deal with the issue of gun violence, murders, etc. Is there anything you can tell the population about that? And also, have you had any recent update as the chairman of the National Security Council in terms of operational procedures of law enforcement, the state security agencies dealing with this matter? Well, the first part of the question, um, we are, I am anticipating that the proclamation of preliminary inquiries the abolition of preliminary inquiries, that that would be effected before the end of the year. That's my understanding, but the Attorney General will be able, might be able to give you something a little better on that. In terms of um, brand new legislation, there are some amendments that we may be able to do, but remember any significant change would require, we have a situation where special majorities would be required to interfere with the constitutional provisions. And I am telling you, once we have anything that requires a special majority, the opposition has a position that that is their strength for it to fail because they don't want any improvement because they believe that the improvement will be for the government. They don't see it as improvement for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. They see it as though it's the government. There are some politicians in this country who would Some politicians in this country who they don't care what they prevent the people from having as long as it, in their little minds, benefit them at the polling station. That's what you have. And the second part of your question was what we do at national security and how we interact with the police and so I meet, I would say, fairly regularly with, we have 10 police divisions in this country meaning the country is divided up into 10 parts, and each division is led by a senior police officer. And I meet with them from time to time to get reports as to what is happening in their districts and to try to encourage them that if each division has a leader who is ensuring that in this division the law is enforced, police officers are living up to their authority and oath of office, and that people have confidence in the structure in there, that we have 10 divisions. If six of them are managed by people who are good, it's like a cricket team. Not every person on the team is a star, but every person is required to contribute to the outcome of the game. And we get we beat on a regular basis. The National Security Council receives reports makes comments, but as you know, we can't direct the police service because that is when you are going to get very upset. I mean, I've, I've seen it very frequently being implied that the prime minister is a dictator and he dictates into a lot of nonsense. We keep our distance from the police decision making with respect to policing where it involves individual actions against any person or any situation. But overall, we interact with the police service through the minister who interacts with the commissioner of police and I dare say maybe other senior officers. That's, that's how it should be. But the minute we require to interfere with the legislation, the police is trying, I mean they have their, 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 their serious issues with the police service, not the least of which is, is the, 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 the trust that the public has or doesn't have because of some of the actions that we see from time to time with police officers. The, that trust is being eroded and they try to build it back and every so often when you think you're building it back, somebody does something that damages it again and so on. But the bottom line is that we are on the job doing that. But the criminals keep adjusting, adjusting. 
And the criminals will always have an advantage in that they decide when they commit the crime and who they commit it on. That's an advantage that only they have. Eh? But in terms of the government providing the resources, the government ensuring that the police knows that they have the support of the government. As I speak to you now, the last um, meeting we had, and one of the things that came up is that there, there isn't enough, they don't have enough vehicles to be able to put more people out in certain situations in terms of patrolling and bringing about a, a, a police defense force. We took immediate steps to get the Minister of Finance. We're in the process right now of funding and buying vehicles from the showroom. Because the process of buying in the long, in the long way, they've been trying to buy vehicles through the normal bureaucratic process. Vemco and the, and the police commissioner the office, that is now going on for months because these are slow processes. But we need to have the soldiers and the police out there immediately. The cabinet took the position, if it is vehicles they don't have, go in the showroom and see what is there. We've done that. So in the next week or two, we, you should see another 50 new vehicles to ensure that when the soldiers want to go out with the police, that there's no impediment of no vehicle. So this, that, that's what we do. That, that, that's, that's the kind of thing we do. We support as far as we are able to, to ensure that they are resourced to respond. Did you sidestep <clears throat> the procurement legislation? No, 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 we did not. It is being done. The, 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 in fact, the, the legislation allows the police department, which is headed by an accounting officer, to procure. Right? I'm, not size, I'm, not, I'm glad you mentioned that. We're not sidestepping any legislation. We are, we, we are using the legislation. Okay? Yes, Fia. Yeah, I have two questions. Um, there was a time previously, on a, a previous PNM government, when there was an attempt to negotiate a truce with when we, At that time, they were called community leaders. Um, do you see this question of the, I know you think that's hard line on the PCE, but can that at all... Do you see what? You say it's a hard no on this piece B. Um, no, I, I don't want you to misunderstand me, because I, maybe I should, I should clarify that a bit before you go further. I, more than anyone, would know, because I'm a Tobagonian, I would know when police was in charge of this country, in the station districts, and the sergeant was in charge. If you, uh, uh, if you were misbehaving in the community, you had an audience with the sergeant, right? The sergeant was sent to call you, because I grew up knowing police sent to call Bacchus. That was the conversation. I, 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 mean, I'm in, I mean, I'm in people Carnage. I know Sergeant Bell was in Carnage. If you are misbehaving in the community in whatever way, from domestic violence to other more serious crimes, if there's any more serious than that, interfacing with the police, so the police will talk to you. In fact, I know, I know people who their parents carried them to the station to get a scolding from the police. That's what, that, that was community policing. Because a misbehaving boy, a mother marched you down to the station for the sergeant to talk to you so that you will know that if you continue along that line, right, there are consequences. So I am not saying that the police should not talk to people who are in fact suspected of getting involved in criminal activity. What I was referring to is giving them this sanction through negotiation of terms and conditions where they're in charge. And I think your question is about where there was some meeting at some time before, some peace deal that was made, I think, under the Manning government, and the press spoke a lot about it. What was the outcome of that? There was just so much talk. Criminals who take a decision for crime as a business and a way of life, two things they're not doing. One, they're not giving up any firearm in any amnesty. Two, they're not giving up any authority in the community, any rank that they would have had. And you've got to be careful that in dealing with them, you don't send the message that they have rank and they get more rank because they could talk to you. You've got to be careful with that. 
But I have no problem with the police talking to anybody. I, I said earlier on, our police service has the authority to speak to any citizen in this country. And that judgment is a judgment for the police. But when you're talking about, oh, well, this gang and that gang negotiate a peace treaty with the police, blowing whistle as a referee, that is not on. With respect to this dispute between Trinidad and Tobago, um, between Venezuela and Guyana, I I wanted to know on what basis you made the statement that if it is one country that understands the principal position of Trinidad and Tobago, it is Venezuela. Is it that this issue has been discussed in any form? at bilateral, uh, bilateral level between Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela so that they said to us, we understand your position. And it is made on the basis that we have been conducting business with the government of Venezuela and the government of Guyana. And we were there when the government of, Guyana, of, of, of Venezuela faced challenges very much in the same way that Venezuela, uh, Guyana is facing it now. And the government, personnel of the government of Venezuela would have seen us at work and see how we handle that to know how we will handle this development that's taking place now. We know because we have been working with them on other issues. And one of the things I'm sure is that the government of Venezuela respects the government of Trinidad and Tobago. And the government of Guyana also respects the government of Trinidad and Tobago. And therefore, our position with them starts off on that basis of respect. They don't expect us to do anything that is unprincipled or even foolish. Prime Minister, why do you think the, this issue, <coughs> which, you've, which you said um, has arisen on several occasions in the past, why do you think um, the particular issue of, of Esquibo has arisen at this point. Anthony, I know you know the answer to that. <laughs> so I look forward to reading it from you. But I'll just say to Trinidad and Tobago, I don't know how many of you know that there are maps, official maps that exist that show Trinidad <laughs> as part of that kind of conversation in the, in the minds of some people. Right? So let us understand our history, understand our region, understand our politics. And when Anthony puts the answer to that question, you will understand that is nothing new. Sorry, yeah, let me have the, the lady. Hi, good afternoon. Cameron Fletcher, Guardian Media. Um, two things. Um, firstly, um, it wasn't mentioned, but the issue of cyber attacks, it's been something that's on the lips of the public, but in the public domain and rather the fear of persons seeing that a lot of personal information is being spread, um, being leaked to the dark web, etc. In fact, it was reported that your personal information as well was shared to the dark web. Um, so my question is, um, do you think this is something that the state should step in, possibly in terms of laws to treat with something like this, or if something is already being done? Um, well, we certainly need to strengthen our legislative framework. Um, we did at an earlier time float a cyber security bill that, of course, whenever you put anything out in this country, the first reaction is uh, really, really. But now, um, especially as we become more and more dependent on the digital age offerings, it is a matter of urgency for us to return to prioritizing the legislation that will deal with the environment of cybermatics, if you may call it that, so that cyber security and a whole new suite of criminal offenses need to be identified and codified. And I expect that the Minister of um, Digital Transformation and the Attorney General will get that before the Cabinet as quickly as you can to ensure that we do have the deterrent effect to the extent that there is deterrence that can be had. And in the event that um, the population can do anything to ameliorate it, that they have the legislative authority 
and support for doing that. It is certainly a part of our economy. We can't back away from that now. Our banks are heavily uh, involved. Our digital database on the public service. Information is power. And there are people who use that power either through threats of misuse or abuse of access to information that is a whole new world. So yes, we need to have new and where, is not, where, where, it is where it exists updated legislation to allow us to live comfortably in the digital age. It, what, one, you know, it's, it's surprising. Um, even the countries with the best systems in the world, this reality of people trying to penetrate databases eh, for that information. Information, I mean, even if the information itself that they access is not harmful to you today, because of what it is, the very fact that they have been able to access it in an, an unauthorized manner is very um, discomforting. So we, we need to get on with putting up some bulwarks there and having the technical capacity to be able to protect ourselves from it. And the final point is, if it does happen, we need to be able to competently deal with it in such a way that the loss of confidence is minimized. Uh, Prime Minister, do you accept that, that your information was leaked um, on the dark web? I've seen, um, I myself have done nothing to find it, but I've seen it being published. I, the media raised with me what they saw. My, um, the people I rely on for technical support, they confirmed that there was some information. Um, it was not, initially, it was said it was my banking information, and I mean, that had me very, very concerned. But it turned out it was my ID card number, my, um, my, my, my TSTT telephone bill. Um, that's where it was, it was a t the telephone bill at TSTT. Because I have a government phone, which is managed at source by TSTT and the, the government department. So I was very, um, I, I was very um, comforted that it wasn't banking because if there, there's information, then there's information. But the whole idea of unauthorized access to databases, I mean, a simple thing like your, your, your health chart, you don't want that in everybody's hand. It might look harmless to you, but criminals can use that in any which way, you know. Um, Minister Gonzalez did say um, it wasn't you. Do you agree? No, no, uh, maybe? he said it wasn't me, yeah. specific to what was in a particular article. What was there was not mine. It was another member of my family, but it turns out that mine was there as well. Prime Minister, TSTT is 51% uh, yeah. owned by the uh, Trinidad and Tobago. Um, were you, as Prime Minister, consulted on the dismissal of the TSTT Chief Executive Officer? No, I was not. Were you informed of it before it happened? I, I knew that there were um, attempts made to ensure that there was accountability and that the government would get a, a clear and accurate report from the company as to what actually happened. That much, that much I knew. Prime Minister, um, if I may t um, talk about the, the Solar Arabia Summit, um, I would carry come. Um, you know, the, um, you have said that um, the refineries were sale. Was that part, you know, discussion? The refinery at point of here? Was, was there any offer, you know, by, by our government? Um, yes, that did come up. Um, that's one of the, one of the issues that we discussed. Um, because we talk about energy security and the presence of an, uh, uh, a refinery that is inoperable for lack of crude did come up, as one would expect. I couldn't speak to that now, but, but the, first, the, fir the first aspect is that it did come up. Um, we will keep talking about it to see whether there are opportunities. And you spoke um, 
our restructuring of you know you know of of Atlantic, right? Um, train one is still gone. Um, at the end of the day, we need more gas. So, so would would that restructuring help? in terms of getting train one up um, and in terms of getting more gas. Train okay. one, again, if, if, if I take you back a little bit, the, the gas curtailment affects all the trains. When the train one issue became public, there was a big hue and cry from our parliamentary colleagues that we had spent, I think it was 34 million US in, on train one, and it was wasted because train one had to be done and la la la. What we said to the country then is because of the ownership structure where train one and train four were the areas where the people of Trinidad and Tobago had a shareholding. We had a 10% in train one and an 11% in train four and there was no shareholding in trains two and three. We understood what that meant if train one was just excised from the business when we wanted to renegotiate a situation where our ownership structure would leave us with some ownership in trains two and three. That appeared to have been too complicated for some people to understand. But what it did, and we did say so, by maintaining train one as we did then, it allowed us to have a seat at the table because it was at the table that you negotiate what happens with trains two and three. At the end of those discussions, I can tell you now that the new arrangement is that we've brought the three trains together and the people of Trinidad and Tobago will have a percentage ownership across two, three, and four. So now train one, even though there's not enough gas to bring train one into operation and there's no plan to do so at this point in time, so we now be dealing with a three train industry the people of Trinidad and Tobago are in a better position because we now have access to earnings from strains two and three and continue to own that 11% or thereabouts in train four. And of course, that could only have been done if we were able to hold to the table those who own trains two and three. That is what a government does. That's called good government. That's called success. We now have in two and three? Um, I wouldn't want to speak to that today, but we do have reason to be um, happy. We have in some documentation to be signed, and I don't want to speak ahead of the signing of those documents. That's what, that's what I'm going to London to see happen in, in, um, in the first week of December. Prime Minister, you said the new arrangements with the Atlantic, um, of course, and BP and Shell. Uh, would increase the revenue to, the, to, to Trinidad and Tobago by billions of dollars. Uh, is the government ever going to disclose how many billions of dollars? We always do. We, we disclose to you how many billions we got by asking, and agree, asking them to, to, to agree with us that we ought to earn more. The Minister of Finance told you and it's available. Minister West is here. I don't know if she had it in her head, but I could give you the assurance that, and I, I'm sure we did that on at least two occasions, I was there when the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Energy on this platform told you how many billions more we got as a result of what we negotiated. Had we not renegotiated those arrangements, we would not have got those additional billions. As a matter of fact, look at it this way. We are now getting earnings of gas at 2.6 billion cubic feet per day as compared to peak times when it was 4.2 billion. But we are still managing to run our country off the earnings of gas because some things happen where a lower volume of gas is giving us about the same kind of revenue that we were getting when a higher volume of gas under different arrangements were being sold. One of the things that we were doing, or we started to do very early, is to try to shift the formula for our take from Henry Hub 
to the international market. Because outside of Henry Hub, Henry Hub is a US pricing basis, which you see normally like $2, $2.75, $3. But elsewhere in the world, there's an Asian market and there's a European market where the price is much higher. We were excluded from those markets because of arrangements that were in place. This government changed that. We are not, we, as we go forward, what are the things that we're doing here? The government's share of gas, which we are entitled to under the contracts, in an earlier time, we had allowed the oil companies to market that share. This government has changed that going forward. Minister Young can give you, I'm going to ask him again to have a day out with you all and give you the details of what he sees. Put it here, but sometimes it's too difficult to absorb all that at one time. But the bottom line is, we would be able to, in fact, we are able to market our own gas and we end up selling it to the same people at a higher price because the arrangements have changed. When we said we were going to make those changes, anybody in this room who was at the spotlight at energy at the Hyatt, go back and read what the government said there. I spoke, Minister Franklin Khan spoke, and we said what our targets were what the areas of our concerns were. We kept to that, and it had borne fruit for us. That has been the government's number one assignment. So as we go forward, the day could come, would come, should come, when gas would flow from next door in Venezuela to us. Gas is a billion dollar industry. Putting pipelines down with costs, hundreds of millions of dollars operating it, but the earnings are in the billions. And if you don't do it, opportunity lost would be in the billions. Okay. Yes, you mentioned, yes, you yes mentioned, Jill, Jill, sorry, and I come to you after. You did mention, um, thank you, you did mention conversations in Saudi Arabia. Uh, is it the state um, oil company of Saudi Arabia? It's Saudi Aramco, oil. yes. A, they have a number of companies. There's a company called Aramco Trading. They trade in oil. They, because you know the oil market in the world is um, you buy oil from here, you blend it with this one there. So it's a whole trading business. They trade in oil. And we did have discussions with them, and we are having discussions with them. In fact, Minister Young is having a follow-up discussion, I think, tomorrow morning on, on that. And we are expecting that those discussions will progress in a particular direction. And the natural gas side of things as well, because of course, Saudi Arabia is a major player in the... Yeah, on the natural gas side, our discussions were mainly in the country too. And I mentioned earlier on that the gas producing people like ourselves in Saudi Arabia and others, we are saying that natural LNG is the clean fuel as against the conversation that you should shut down hydrocarbon business. So we, 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 are, we are diplomatically together on that. And with respect to um, petrochemicals, we are also in the business of the petrochemical industry. So we are aligned in, in that way. And um, we do believe that we are being affected by climate change. And we need help in protecting ourselves. The Saudis are willing to listen to us with, with development financing to deal with issues of climate change the effect of climate change. They are a major producer of solar power infrastructure. We are looking in that direction. As you know, we're currently building 112 megawatts, and we have to build more as we go forward. And also, we both know that a day will come when we can't rely as heavily as we could, or as we are, on hydrocarbons, either because it has run out or because the world would have changed and what is now being advocated come to pass. So we have to build a future that is not entirely so heavily dependent on it. And that's why they are going full speed ahead with some huge investments in tourism. And we believe that even here in Trinidad and Tobago, especially Tobago, that we need to invest more in tourism because it's a more sustainable industry. But you need to do the investment now so that when the drying up comes for whatever reason, your presence in the tourism environment would see you accessing earnings. They are 
interested in considering develop, development finance for tourism in our country and in the region. So hopefully, I don't know if we can persuade our local entrepreneurs to see it that the world is saying now, invest in Trinidad and Tobago, in tourism, and financing is available. That's where you're at. Yes, we are, sorry. Um, the, you said that two flights were sent for the CARICOM leaders by the Saudi government. Um, I wanted to ask whether that was, um, that transportation was initiated by the Saudi government, whether they met all the costs, did they yeah. provide also the cost for accommodation? And do you um, feel that in, a, in an arrangement like that, our, well, certainly our opposition might raise questions about um, CARICOM leaders sort of being paid for? Well, let, let, me answer, let me answer the question. Yes, the Saudis provided two jets to take us, one came to Barbados and one came to uh, Jamaica, Miami. One came to Miami. So heads from the Northern Caribbean, like Belize, Bahamas, Jamaica, they went from Miami. Those from the Southern Caribbean, Suriname, Trinidad, Tobago, Grenada, we went from Barbados. Um, if the Saudis openly and transparently provide transport to us, we don't sell ourselves short. And to be concerned about any opposition position, that because we accept transportation to a meeting in this way, that we somehow would compromise our national position. But I'll expect to say that. You see, <laughs> if that is what you are, then clearly you'll think others are like that too. And it is quite normal for heads of government to be accommodated when they visit. You always see it in CARICOM. Whenever there's a CARICOM meeting here, no matter how contentious the issues are on the table, the government of Trinidad and Tobago pays for every head who comes in here, accommodation-wise. And when we go out, the country in which the meeting is taking place, that country foots the bill for the head of government. So if, if it means that because somebody is giving you a hotel room and an apple in your room or a, or a couple of grapes and a bottle of water, that you will sell out the country, that's not how we, do, that's not how we see it. There, there are two standard CARICOM meetings. One is the intercessional meeting, and then the other one is the sessional meeting. Two meetings per year, at least two meetings per year. But those two are fixed. And so at least twice a year, the head of each CARICOM country goes to another country, right? and sometimes in your own country. When I, when I spoke earlier, what I didn't say is that during that period, when CARICOM, with this new batch of leaders, most of them knew, I happened to chair CARICOM during that period. Trinidad and Tobago was in the chair of CARICOM during the pandemic. The whole question of vaccines was on my desk. Right? So the leadership changes every six months. And that is not something that... So when you see opposition members trying to compute how much per diem the Prime Minister earned because he went to meetings, I ask you to disregard these jokers. And I would only say one thing to that too, you know. The operative verb there is earn, per diem. I would leave this office quite satisfied with my earnings. And I'll be more satisfied if the honest truth that is told when I leave this office is that I am not accused of stealing public money. So they could talk as much as they like about how much per diem the prime minister gets. That per diem is set by the government and is the same one that was being paid when Puss in Boots was running all around the world. Australia, Sri Lanka, Brazil, all about is the same thing, except that on this occasion, there's a prime minister who can account for what those visits mean. You would know how many times I addressed you all on the way out and on the way in at Piaco Airport, telling you where I'm going, where I've been, and on the way back I tell you what has transpired. Where else were you accustomed to that? Where? 
I came in on Saturday afternoon, dog tired after a 14 hour flight. I didn't see you then, because I might have been too tired to talk to you. But I first thing on Monday, I'm here talking to you. But I wouldn't see that in the editorial though. What I will see is conflating what this government does with what somebody else has done. As though all of we the same. We are not the same. We are quite different. And when you talk about this crime talks that the wrong, the wound, ask, ask them what happened with the Welsh report and the Joint Select Committee in Parliament on healthcare delivery. Ask about that. And I look forward to your article. Yes, I, I, I bypass it. Yes, Prime Minister. Um, coming close to the end, right? So that might be our last question, unless there's a very good one coming from somebody else. Just like the concern. Trinidad and Venezuela um, is expected to sign off on a license for Adrian Gaz. I'm asking this because it's being reported in international media. Um, I'm reading the article now saying Venezuela close to approving offshore gas deal with Trinidad. Shell. Minister Young is in Venezuela on his way there right now because he leads our team and our team is on the way to Venezuela. These are complicated issues. Eh? It's not something I say to go and buy a hospital and go home. It's not like that at all. These issues are very complicated, that they are large. This is a billion dollar industry, and especially at initiation. What we are doing here with that dragon arrangement is very far reaching, complicated, but once you get it done, it will flow more smoothly after. Because what we are aiming to do here is tap into a gas field outside of our country, bring it here, commercialize it so that they get paid, and it's the kind of business where if you miss by one cent, one cent, the outcome of that is billions of dollars. So if you over here, people are arguing over a cent in a meeting, that meeting that's taking place in Caracas, it is a cent in the formula, but it has far-reaching consequences. And because, you know, it's the first time when it comes to pass, and I'm confident it will come to pass sometime. It's the first time that Venezuela is selling its gas to anybody outside its border. So everybody wants to make sure that that scent is on the right side of the decimal point. Right? So Minister Young has done so much work on this, you know, that, you know, I talked to him from my bed. And my wife sometimes said to me, you're not tired harassing Stuart, but, but we have to work. But he came in with me from on Saturday, and he's off to, to Caracas now. He's on the flight now. He's gone, yeah. And he's going to be there for maybe a day or two. And, but um, they're working on the license, right? And that's a good thing for us. When you learn to be good, let's, let, let, let's keep hope alive. Don't be beaten down by this constant spewing of negative and failures who other people, you know, invite upon us. We, we, we're not doing too badly. It's a difficult time, but we're not doing too badly. Do you think there's any way that the situation in the Essequibo could jeopardize the drug and gas development? Um, yes, there are always risks because, I mean, it, it's, it's like a nuclear reaction. Once it gets started, you, may, you could lose control of it. The last thing we want is for us not to be in a period of peace and a zone of peace. I don't have a crystal ball, but things, especially um, where diplomatic matters are concerned and that nature, you, I have no um, forecast to make as to how it will go. But I could tell you what I would not like to see. I would not like to see the relationship between Venezuela and Guyana deteriorate to a point where consequent actions would negatively damage all of us. Because all of us would be damaged. Because the dragon gas that we are after, Venezuela has an interest there. Guyana has an interest there too. Eh? We, have a, we, are, we, are, we are also working very closely with Suriname, where they have found significant gas. And Suriname is willing to cooperate with Trinidad and Tobago. The logical thing there to bring that gas to market is to the best option to put South American gas to the market. It's Point Lisa's. 
our real strength in all these negotiations is the existence of point leases. The pipelines, small thing, big money, but technically small thing. And that pipeline will have to come to us from Suriname to Venezuela to Sur Go and look at Europe. Pipelines come all the way across Europe from Asia. Why is it that we can't have the same thing here and benefit from an economy where we already have access to the world market for products that are required on the world market? So governments are seeing it that way, and we trust that all the governments see it as beneficial to all of us, and we create that economy based on the resources, the God-given resources that we have. And to do that, we need peace, we need security, we need respect, and we need good wishes for each other. Up a bit. Uh, Last question. Last, I know you have been away, but I, I don't know if you have heard um, Iowa George's new song. Who? I, Iowa George's new song in which he sung the national anthem at the beginning. There are people taking umbrage about you know the way the national anthem um, should be rendered. And I know um, before the the past president, you know, had um, she had expressed some some concern, you know, in, in which right. let, me talk, was, let me answer that. Let, let, let me take off my my prime minister hat and leave my ball head and talk to you as a fellow citizen. Frankly, I am not, what's, what's the verb I should use? I am not jumping up and down about the national anthem being used that way in any calypso. There's something that ought to be special about your national anthem. And the reason why you stand when it is being sung, I don't stand up on any hymn being sung or any other. You stand when the national anthem is being sung for a reason. And that gives it a profile and a place that no other song has. And on that basis, I would say, I would rather if the national anthem is not treated in that way. Eh? Thank you all very much. See you again sometime soon. Thank you. You ever tried talking to your child and there's a total and complete misunderstanding and it turns out to be into a shouting match? Be mindful of what you say and more importantly, how you say what you say. Today I want to share with you just a few thoughts on communication. To build healthy parent-child relations, communication